Although rocks behave under stress may seem a very academic branch of geology, far removed from everyday life, but in fact it's one of the most practical, because to understand how rocks behave under stress is to understand the how and the why of earthquakes. And to understand the how and the why of earthquakes is to raise the possibility of predicting them. And that, for people in earthquake belts, is just about as practical and as important as geology can get. Something else that we'll see in the following hour is once again the interplay between laboratory experiments and geological fieldwork. We've already seen it at work in the interpretation of igneous rocks and sedimentary rocks and metamorphic rocks. And once again, laboratory experiments are crucial in this branch of geology. The following hour is a full hour of deformation of the crust. When rocks are subjected to stress, they deform. And you should remember from the unit on metamorphic rocks that we've already looked at the behavior of rock when it deformed plastically under conditions of high temperature and pressure. You'll remember the experiment where the uh, specimen of rock was sealed in a capsule and subjected to high directed pressure in a heat chamber. And when that specimen came out again, it was folded into an S shape, the kind of shape that one sees on outcrops down Highway 69 in the so-called Grenville rocks, rock that has very obviously behaved in a plastic fashion, folded into concertina-like folds. Now, you will also remember an experiment from that same unit in the metamorphic uh, rock unit that marble slabs were able to deform a little elastically so we've already looked at two ways that rocks behave, plastically and elastically. The purpose of this program is to investigate the deformation of rocks uh, a little farther, to begin to look at folds and faults in some detail. And a good uh, place to begin is with the question, just what is stress? Now, stress we can illustrate with this brick and a sugar cube the area of the sugar cube, about one square centimeter. And if I balance the brick on the top, then the stress on that sugar cube is about two or three pounds, the weight of the brick per square centimeter. A very much greater stress was applied to this specimen of concrete in order to make it break, a directed stress down of something perhaps in the order of 10 or 20,000 pounds per square centimeter. Both of these are directed stress. That is stress acting down, uh, squeezing the specimen, if you like. In rocks which are buried beneath the surface of the earth, there's also another kind of pressure or stress, and that's the confining pressure, which holds the rock in shape, if you like. In this specimen, if we'd encased this in a steel jacket, then we would have been able to exert a confining pressure on that specimen as the directed stress uh, was produced by the piston above it. So rocks are subjected to those two kinds of stress, the directed and the confining. After a rock has behaved initially elastically, like the marble slabs, there are two other things it can do. Like this piece of wood, that's its elastic deformation, the rocks can break. They've reached their elastic limit. That wood reached its elastic limit. This rock specimen reached its elastic limit 
under directed stress. If the confining pressure is great enough, if the temperature is high enough, if the stress, the directed stress, is applied slow enough, and particularly if there's some fluid around between the grains of the rock, then the rock will deform plastically. Let's have a look at the way that rocks would deform plastically. And we'll use this squeeze box with a layer of two layers of sand with an intervening layer of plaster to illustrate what happens to rocks when they behave plastically. Both the sand and the plaster are behaving plastically. You can see that a fold is being produced. And also that the plaster layer is beginning to break. That's the kind of form that's produced when rocks deform plastically. There's this fold here a rather roof-shaped fold, and then here, where the rock has not been able to deform, or the, the plaster has not been able to deform plastically any farther, there are some beginnings of some fractures in the, ro in the, in the plaster. In rocks, this is what happens when plastic deformed salt layers, and it is deformed plastically, very much like the metamorphic rocks that you saw in the metamorphic unit and in that photograph. In this specimen, plastic deformation has also taken place. These were originally pebbles, round, but now flat, because they deformed plastically under directed stress that squeezed from above. Here are further specimens of folds produced in limestone, which behaved plastically. Once it had no longer been able to deform elastically, behaved plastically. Here is another specimen. In this case, a layer that was originally quite straight has bent right back on itself. From the other side, you can see that distortion, that deformation, even more. We can use plasticine, like the wet plaster in the squeeze box there, to illustrate the, uh, the form which rocks take when they deform plastically. In this case, this fold has been produced by the squeezing by directed pressure from either side. We call that form an anticline. Anti from opposite, cline from slopes, opposite slopes, a rather roof shape. And the plane which divides that fold, that anticline, into two is called the axial plane of the fold. Each of the two sides is called a limb of the fold. Here then is one limb, here is a second limb. The axial plane divides the fold into two symmetrical halves. When that fold is formed, the rock, represented by these layers of plasticine, must flow. We can demonstrate how much it flows by making ourselves a fold in which the two layers of plasticine are not attached closely to one another. In this case, there is the anticline, and you can see that this much movement, this much sliding, has taken place between the two layers. In this fold here, the two layers were held tightly together because of the overlying pressure, or would be if it were rock, and flow, in fact, had to occur, rather like the kind of differential 